Welcome. Bonjour. Vous écoutez le podcast Dirty Feet sur les ondes de No More Radio. You're listening to the Dirty Feet podcast on the No More Radio Network. Nous sommes vos animateurs et animatrices. We are your hosts, Alison Burns, J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert. Listen in. Écoutez. We're going to move you. Hello, this is Stephanie Morin Robert. I'm here in Vancouver, British Columbia, for another episode of Dirty Feet. Um, as you know, we've been touring across the country uh, for the last three months uh, with For Body and Light. And now that that's over, I've decided to extend my visit out west. And I have the pleasure of uh, continuing interviews here in Vancouver. Uh, so today we have the pleasure of having David McMurray Smith with us uh, for a discussion about his artistic journey and also uh, about a company that he's currently running here uh in the Vancouver area. So over the last 40 years, uh, David has performed uh, and worked professionally in the areas of theater, ballet, opera, mime, and clown as a creator, a performer, a director, a choreographer, and an educator. So um, definitely a perfect candidate for this type of interview. Uh, he is a movement specialist, body worker, creative, and a performance consultant, and an experienced counselor who's taught at several years universities, was head instructor at the Vancouver Playhouse Theatre School, was the movement director for the music, theatre and opera programs at the Banff Centre for the Arts, and has also been a guest resource artist at the People's Light and Theatre Company in Philadelphia. Um, and I mean, that's only the tip of the iceberg. So it's an extreme pleasure to have you here. Uh, and thank you for accepting to have this conversation with me today. Uh, you're very welcome. Um, so your first formal education began uh, quite a few years ago at University of Massachusetts um, <laughs> when uh, you, ha you kind of embarked on a double major in theater and dance. What made you decide to do a double major? And <laughs> what was your first experience like as a student? Well, I, uh, I began uh, actually, in, I was in pre-med in, in university when I started. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'd pre-tested for that program, uh, and that was always my intention growing up, to be a doctor. Um, yet, the day I arrived on campus, uh, unfortunately, they didn't have me as an existing participant in that program, or even a student on campus. Uh, and it turned out that there had been a, a mistake in the recording of Uh, of an individual who had withdrawn. There were five David Smiths in my class, oh, really? a very large class, and um, they had, a, was pre-computer, so they, they had a, a typo, and they didn't, the middle initial of the individual who had withdrawn was, uh, middle initial was N, uh -huh. like for Norman, and my middle initial is M, Mac Murray, and they had typed an, uh, an M instead of an N, And therefore, I was uh, dropped from everything. Whoa. Uh, and that individual was still in their class, but they weren't there. <laughs> so, so it was a great confusion, and I lost all of my courses. And there was a waiting list, so people just slotted right in. So I had to beg my way into a few of the courses that I needed, but I had to fill it up with other stuff. And uh, one of the things that I stuffed in there was an introduction to theater course, because I'd done theater in church groups in high school and things and uh and in that situation um discovered that there was an awful lot of um uh high end academics in at, at that time in the early 70s uh bedside manner wasn't necessarily an attribute in studying to be a doctor and so i i worked very hard and diligently and maintained an 85 average And that I was nowhere near the competition rate of 99 plus to in order to get into. And I, so I, re, I, I was confused and realized I was not sure what was going to happen next. And in the meantime, I took theater. Uh, and in the meantime, after that, uh, my first uh, romantic girlfriend was uh, a senior at the time and had been in the dance department. Um, and they needed men. 
as they seemed at that time always to need. Uh, so I was kind of introduced into the dance world that way uh, and became aware that, uh, of both enjoying both and also recognizing that dance was probably the hardest thing I'd ever encountered in my life to do. Uh, I'd grown up and did a lot of work on a farm and a lot of physical territory, but uh, this was totally different. And so it became this over the time that it, that it was by a circumstance of that error that I ended up working in and focusing in the, in the performing arts. And then the double major became something that was an option uh, by creating, I had to create my own form uh, for it. They had the opportunity to do an individual concentration degree. And the rest begins to be kind of a, a journey of uh, working in different fields, uh, all movement-based, uh, the root. Um, and that was the intrigue at the time. So that was the main initiation into the yeah, field mistake. of... Oh, wow. <laughs> That's really interesting. So from there, after uh, graduating from uh, the university, mm -hmm. you moved to New York. I did, yeah. And uh, what, was, what was that transition like, going from Massachusetts to, to New York? Uh, the, it was like culture shock. Yeah, I could imagine. <laughs> I was, my, the town I grew up in had 1,800 people in it. It was mm. small. Uh, and... The university was big enough in that respect. You know, it was a it's a large university, uh, and that w that was a shock in itself too. I had kind of acclimatized to that, and it was rather a, a, a cold-hearted decision at that time to you know, not cold-hearted, but I, th I guess rational to say, well, mm. uh, while my body is young enough, I guess I'll focus on this dance thing. Yeah, and become a and take the you took the. Uh, Jeffrey Ballet yeah, program. The yeah, I went down and, and, uh, and auditioned a, a few places to see about getting into program in New York. Uh, my first choice was the Joffrey um, because of what they, the quality of uh, neoclassical mm -hmm. uh, and theatrical, uh, the nature of their, of their range that they had. And they worked with many different techniques. Mm -hmm. They weren't focused in a singular framework as much as uh, American Ballet Theater in New York City. They, they were uh, so they had a, my background as a was because I started only when I was seventeen, eighteen. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I'd intensely studied for for five years, but uh, or four years. But then I, you know, I I wasn't I hadn't been pre trained as a classical classical. Yeah. Uh, and I so I auditioned uh, and and got in there. Uh, on full scholarship, which was really wonderful. Wow. Um, and then moved to New York, and that was the culture shock. Mm -hmm. of, I was never so lonely in a place with so many people in my life uh, every, at, through that time that I was, I was in New York. Uh, so there was a lot of... Um, I'll, I'll honestly say there, there was a fair amount of tears <laughs> and scared. And you were uh, 20, fear. about 21 I was then? 20... I was 20, just, just almost 21 at the mm -hmm. time. Yeah. Just, and how was yeah. that on the body to, to kind of dive in head first into a, a intensive training in, in ballet? I was pretty well prepared for that from mm -hmm. the, from the work at, at, uh, at university cause it was an intense focus there as well. Um, and also it was, um, more so, let's put it that way, uh, mm -hmm. in this, because of the, the, the dramatic intensity with which, uh, the specification of the work was um, was much more focused. You, you know, that was all pretty much. I was doing other. I was still doing theater classes yes, and mime and classes mime. and stuff yeah. but, uh, on the side and jazz classes with Luigi, uptown. And mm -hmm. uh, but the, that main focus was really really strong, um, and so they. It, it, I had the way I had trained and what I had done had of course shaped my muscular mm -hmm. uh, uh, form and and I was told also that uh, to, to stop stretching because I was not as strong as I was flexible hmm. uh, and so that so began a, a, sh a shaping of, of focus in the different styles of ballet mm -hmm. uh, with with the royal and the chiquetti and the Russian and yeah the, the different backgrounds uh, and men's class was a new thing to me 
at that time as well, um, which is... Were you often the only man uh, in, in class training for ballet? And this was this it, kind of the starting oh, point? Oh, yeah. Of- we were, I was just one of the, a bunch. Mm. I was, you know, I was not... At university, there was a few. Yeah. Uh, and here, of course, there were lots. In New York, Lots yeah. of men. Uh, so it was a it was a different experience to actually have a, you know a group of twenty five thirty people men in the room mm-hmm. uh, simultaneously doing a focus on men's uh, men's dance men's ballet uh, aspects of that uh, power focus and and aerial and so forth mm. you know so yeah that was a new that was a quite a new adventure and. Uh, and I felt, I just felt very, uh, I, I guess you say very alert, alert, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> p- periodically terrified <laughs> <laughs> in relation to, you know, getting and learning and, mm-hmm. and holding the, the scholarship and, uh, and being, uh, and just being good, I guess, that, that drive yeah. at that age was you know, like, I, I, I have to get this, I have to get this. And, yeah. uh, and everybody was so intensely myopically focused in, on what their life was doing that um, it was very difficult to have much of a, a much camaraderie or relationship with others. In, yeah. you know, there's a competition, there's a sense of competition very high uh, in, the, in the environment. And did you, what was the difference between the environment? Because you did continue mime and theater studies mm-hmm. while you were at the Jeffrey Ballet. Mm-hmm. And um, did you find, because I think at this point, after after your time at the ballet, you decided to uh, move to Canada, right? Yeah. Shortly yeah, after I, that. Yeah, I did. Um, for the Ballet Jazz de, de Montréal. Yes, in, in, that was when so they first when, became incorporated as a company. Yeah, yeah. and what, that decision of jumping from... Uh, Back again into... <laughs> <laughs> to more, to a different style again. Yeah, because you were taking jazz uh, when you were in yes. New York. And was there something that sparked that, or a the, desire to leave the company and move to Canada? Well, the, the, uh, the training program with the Joffrey um, was one that... Um, I, I I truly loved it, and at the mm-hmm. same time, the jazz teacher that I had, whose name was Richard Jones, mm-hmm. uh, had worked with a woman named Eva von Genshi, uh and taught her as well. And she had she was one of the, the co-founders of probably the main inspiration for Le Ballet Jazz in the beginning. Oh. Yeah. And uh, and because she and Richard had worked together and trained and trained together, and he'd been also a teacher. It it felt familiar. It felt familiar, and and there was also that connection Mm -hmm. that Richard, who was my jazz teacher at university, had said, uh, had had been in contact with Ava, and Ava said, well, we're starting a company, and, um, you know, we're we're, we're looking for male dancers. And so Mm -hmm. Richard... So, well, I I know this guy, and <laughs> and so it started that way. It started through that oh, wow. that personal connection, of unintended networking, I guess. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, I, so I was put in touch with Le Ballet Jazz with with Eva and uh, Madame Salvin, who was the co- the co-founder and uh, of as well co-foundress, and um, came came up uh, to what I thought was actually, in my naive way, uh, actually a job. So I gave up my apartment in New York. I gave up my scholarship, oh my God. and f- flew up to Montreal. Whoa. And like again, this is just you know, a small town kid still feeling like out of his depth. Yeah. And a new, not only you know, it was a new country, but it was also one that had a language that I was only slightly familiar with from mm-hmm. from school. Uh, so it was a new adventure and a scary one at the same time. But I arrived on April Fool's Day, 1975, <laughs> which coincidentally oh, was, no. <laughs> was also the and immigration uh, was held up for about four hours. Well, and they ended up getting uh, I don't know if it was Eva or I can't remember which member of the uh, whether it was Madame Salbin or um, or, or Eva who came. I think it was I think it was Jean-Vierre Salbin who came and. Um, to the airport, if I recall correctly, and clarified that, yeah, indeed, I had been invited up, and n- in fact, no, this was a two-week working audition. Oh God! <laughs> <laughs> Which put a little, again, a little f- more fuel on the fire to be uh, focused with what I was doing. <laughs> uh, and fortunately, it turned out that uh, that they did 
they did like me and then they just had to prove that they weren't taking any Canadian jobs away mm -hmm. and that began my my life here in Canada yeah and you've been here ever since I have yeah and you also had um, you also worked with uh, Compagnie to Danse Entre Six et les Grands Ballets Canadiens yes was that um, for contracts or for a long period of time or after les grands ballets uh, les after ballets les jazz. Jazz, yeah mm -hmm. yeah it, um, again a kind of uh, the, uh, a circumstance that in which um, romance was a part I suppose um, mm -hmm. <laughs> the W uh, one of the women who was in the com eventually came to Les Belles Jazz uh, w had been in Les Grands, mm -hmm. and um, we struck up a relationship and ended up uh, becoming a um, married couple at that time. <laughs> and uh, and that she went back to Les Grands, and and I was had always had in my head that that would be a pinnacle of what I would call success for myself was to to actually get into a ballet company a real yeah. ballet yeah. company uh not not to di not to discount the the or or have disrespect for for les ballet jazz at all but that that it in yeah. my mind you know of uh, course. Thing, uh, uh. so i uh I, I i auditioned uh and i also uh first with Lawrence Gratis uh, and at Entre Six mm -hmm. which was also a lovely very small but uh six I think six dancers and very very wonderful little ensemble uh and, and he was a, a very innovative um choreographer a wonderful wonderful uh choreographer and I, I always enjoyed what they did and then it turned out that I had that period of time which was about eight, about eight months Mm -hmm. with that company and did a did a tour with them uh and then my audition with les grands was accepted so they they took me even without my great feet uh, <laughs> uh, and because again they were they were they contemporary mm -hmm. uh, and progressively adding more contemporary work or modern i guess they at the time we we called it uh into the repertoire mm -hmm. so it wasn't purely classical Uh, and because I had that and the theatrical background, I, I started. To f I fit in quite nicely and had mm -hmm. the opportunity to advance to uh, as to a soloist in the in the ballet terms because they're more hierarchical mm -hmm. in uh, in the class that you were dancing in. And because uh, when the choreographers came, they um, they would audition the the company at, for what they wanted. It wasn't mm -hmm. just given to the soloists and, and principal dancers necessarily. They wanted to see everybody because they wanted to see who, who would fit what they wanted to do, what they were setting on the company. Yeah. So um, in, that, in that situation, I, was, I fit into and could, was chosen um, in, the, in some of the modern with, uh, um, with the companies that were coming up some of them to, to do the choreographers um, and that was so that that was you know became something that then worked and the time frame that I was there was two two seasons two years hmm. uh, that uh, that I was moving with with the company so um, that was and it was you know it was a lovely situation and working with with uh, you know Brian McDonald was was uh, director uh, mm -hmm. uh, before and then uh, and then again and his choreography um, I he chose me to do some lovely you know, lovely pieces a piece with him that became quite um, known for the in the time that it was done uh, and John Butler um, uh paul paul uh paul taylor um oh, and the oh gosh the fellow who did Lenos at the time and is lar lubovich hmm. and that and it was some lovely lovely work and they've subs and it's ongoing they have some great choreographers coming up to uh set contemporary work on the company and and so it was a it was a great experience it was a great experience yeah, yeah and after that and after that you decided to mainly focus on theater from that point yeah i on. went back to theater and mm -hmm. actually focused on the physical theater training in mime, in mime and mm -hmm. uh in clown through the through the um, fellow who was a certified lecoq uh teacher in um in the physical theater training uh and 
it wasn't. It, I decided to. Uh, yes, I, I found that I was. Uh, um, it was a bit a feeling like I was didn't have enough freedom to find more of what was happening mm. in my desires as an artist. So a bit to, of a crave for Yeah, a craving for a little bit more. Mm-hmm. I, it was a little bit felt like I had blinders on, come here, do this, get on the bus, get off the bus, do this show, you know, now do what this choreographer, choreographer asked for and so forth. Um, and I also had a, a, a very um, serious injury, a back injury, yeah. that... Uh, I recovered from and went back to the company and then realized that I had to monitor myself. And it was kind of a realization about um, more biomechanical appropriateness for myself. <laughs> and I had to take care of myself mm-hmm. in a, in a, more specifically because of the, the nature of the and severity of the back injuries that I had sustained. Uh, so I had to be more in charge. And, mm-hmm. and so it, be, it was, um, it seemed appropriate. And so I went back to, mm-hmm. For more training and, and connecting more into that area again, and um, and that was in Toronto, and uh, and then ended up being part of the that company, um, uh, Mime Company Unlimited at the time, and that that school with Ron East had had evolved from uh, Canadian National Mime School, which had closed, and he he took the initiative to have his own school, which. In history, is, it was there, and then he moved to England and ran there for many years. And I'm not sure where he is now. I think he's back in Toronto again. Hmm. You know, um, but uh, so I, and so that was a a, a, a 12 month focused time hmm. frame with with that again and getting it energized into that world again uh, and extending into yeah. into other areas of it. Yeah. And your research, uh, I think you did an extended research with Pachinko. Where was was that yeah. in Toronto, or was that? It was Montreal, Montreal. and Toronto. Okay. Yeah, um, during that time, uh, it was actually pretty much simultaneous that I was introduced uh, and became aware of Richard. Uh, and the clown, the the clown approach through the Lecoq training, uh, and the physical theater training, and the mask training that is all part of that process. Uh, he was because the the instructor was following the pr- the procedures and methodologies that he trained in at Lecoq and was a certified teacher of it. And I, I was in I was how did I get touched with that? I was I'm not sure exactly how I re- I can't quite remember how I got introduced to Richard, but it was I think it was, you know there was a, a poster on a a little handmade <laughs> mimeograph poster, mm-hmm. uh, and that was something that that. Um, caught my attention. Uh, there was a woman in Toronto named Naomi Terrell, who had uh, her own studio down <laughs> in the, in a, an industrial area that was um, that we got into a, a, a kind of cargo elevator and shut the doors up. They shut vertically, and you rode up a little bit and went into. It was very interesting to. This was in Montreal. This was in Toronto. Okay, Toronto. So I was first there, uh-huh. uh, and. Uh, and her, she taught mime, and so that was, you know, I was just kind of interested. And and there was also a woman in, that I was studying mime with as well in in Toronto, uh, Frau Tiltil, who was a marvelous corporal mime teacher, um, and she was quite old at the time. Um, she has her own stories, an incredible artist story, uh, of background. Um, and so I was, I was looking at the mime world. So it was through Naomi that I met Richard. Mm-hmm. And I started, and I did a, I did a, a neutral mask workshop with him while I was still studying neutral mask. At the t- happened to course, mm-hmm. be coincidental with what I was doing in the physical theater program, uh, and that it was just a convergence of circumstances. And then ha- being aware and liking what I, I experienced with him, uh, we, I went was back in Montreal uh, mm-hmm. after conclusion that time, and so he was on the radar then. And then when I saw he was in in Montreal um, teaching, mm-hmm. going to teach uh, a, a course, uh, and, and I, that I I was also doing mime study with um, uh, at uh, Mime Omnibus in Montreal with Denise Belanger and uh, Jean Eslen, uh and their their brilliant work with with the corporal mime training, and I was just steady on training with them and. Uh, and I was, my marriage had fallen apart, 
uh, and I was doing different things around uh, in, in television work and various things in, in, in teaching in Montreal. And so I, then I took class with, with Richard. I took the clown course with Richard. Um, and that was, you know, I'd, I, would, I had helped uh, Linda Rabin at the time in Montreal um, help open her first studio. And again, it was in this, and it was a wonderful little, it was a building and there was lots of great space in it. I don't know, I just wish there was somebody like that out here. Uh, <laughs> and w we created a, helped her open and create and, you know, painting and cleaning and setting up the stuff. And, and Richard was going to do his class there. So uh, I did a class with him there, and it was a singular mass class. Mm -hmm. It wasn't the whole program, because at that time of, of the clown procedure, as he was innovating it and developing it at the time, it was a single mass work that he first did. Uh, and then uh, a year later, I, I took it again. I don't go into the great detail about it, but the, uh, we weren't allowed to play our own mask in the first time somebody else did and we played mm. somebody else's and then a year later we were allowed to go back and play our first one so it was quite a you know it was a, a the first one you the first one i'd made year. a year ago wow yeah okay. uh and by that time we, so that that experience was there and then then i did the the six mask um clown through mask course that he was teaching at the time at that time as well in developing that um so over a period uh, along with some other, a couple of other particular classes with with Richard, that it was a period of about four years that I was w doing intensive workshops and other mm -hmm. and different other things as well, and then back in and doing the mime uh, with uh, Mim Omnibus and uh, television work and teaching and surviving mm -hmm. that way in, around uh, Montreal, uh, and uh, and so over that four year period was working in the with the corporal mime as well as mm -hmm. as with richard um yeah yeah uh, and that's where the segue happened into uh banff banff yeah yeah and which you were involved with uh for about eight years yeah yeah i was it was um and they overlap slightly so i'd be out of banff and then back mm -hmm. in the summer in montreal uh, studying like again and doing so. Life. It was lovely. Yeah, it was pretty, <laughs> it was pretty, great. pretty, um, pretty fortunate. Yeah. 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 Well, tell us about your experience with the Banff Center for the Arts. You were invited uh, first to do movement work with. Yes, um, actually, to be dance teacher. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, um, they were developing a, a program. They'd done a pilot project for what they called a music theater program hmm. uh, that was going to be. That if it was accepted, they would have a win you know winter a whole a whole year more or less uh, well year an uh, academic year September to to May uh, or April and uh, and it was to be intended to be uh, a field for triple threat performers <laughs> uh, to and to create new opera mm -hmm. new opera was the intention and and I. Uh, I did uh, get hired as the dance component of that program, mm -hmm. and our first year out there, um, we uh, I started to be a, a thorn in the artistic director's side <laughs> by and poking him constantly in that first first term to say, um, you know. We ought to do some mask. We ought to do some clown. We ought to do. We <laughs> ought to more do. We need, we need more, yes, pushing, pushing, pushing. <laughs> and uh, so I was. I, I had. I created my own methodology of approach to for this program, and uh, and began a great learning experience for myself in that. I um, because I think that when you want to share your experience with others. Uh, it's a fascinating thing to do, and it's a great learning experience to be. And mm -hmm. I, be, I fell in love with uh, being a facilitator and instructing. Um, fortunately, because that's <laughs> also been a, <laughs> a very great support in the process of, of the journey of all the way up to uh, till all now. All the way up to now, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. It's been a, a and it, because I had the for, fortune of enjoying it a great deal, it became a vocation, um, and it continues to be. Mm. Uh, very, very strong one. Um, you helped develop a program uh, here at a college in Vancouver, I believe, mm -hmm. uh, that involves a th theater as a therapeutic 
uh, art form. Uh, yes. So maybe yes, talk a, about that a little bit, and yeah. if, if, um, if, yeah. Yeah, yeah like, I mean, I'll take it back briefly to, to the prog- this program at, at Banff mm-hmm. um, was one that uh, became a two-year program. Mm-hmm. Quite quickly, they decided we're going to add oh, another yeah. year for those some of some of whom were in the first year and do a touring program with a show and so forth. So during that time was um, and being being part of creating a methodology for an, for a new quote idea yeah. uh, in approach to uh, creative work. Um, became a real mainstay in, in my experience as well of, of being in the foundation of, of creating work. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that's been a major part of my, my experience of uh, discovering and new formulas for creating work and new formulas for developing ensemble, uh, understanding more about the psychology of, and politics mm-hmm. of ensemble creation. Uh, has been a that started in in um, in Banff at the program, at the program because of uh, being a part of that and continued uh, until when I did leave there uh, I, I again met a wall of saying well this is this is limiting and the, mm-hmm. the center is is could be much more uh, they have much more potential than I felt felt was being realized mm-hmm. um, and my own artistic desires were were needing so mm-hmm. I, I I left the program and did a, an intense again an intense year of study in um, with Linda Putnam in Massachusetts who is Grotowski background yeah and that work fed in another thread of the of the stuff that will make sense later getting I'll get back to your question <laughs> um, and out of that year coming then to Vancouver mm-hmm. uh, and the second program that I developed what was a major part in, in developing the methodology for was the, the um, uh, Vancouver Playhouse Theatre School. Mm-hmm. Uh, f- and we did, that's, that was a two-year program focused on one group. We didn't take people in every two years, every year. We just once for two years. Then I did two, pr- two rounds of, of developing, uh, of working and developing and then working those programs, which was also a great opportunity and a, and a great challenge and a great reward. Uh, kind of consider it my postgraduate education, hmm. uh, both those, both the, the experiences and and out of all of that, when the Playhouse Theater School out here, when the board decided they they weren't going to have a school anymore, I was kind of set adrift. And in that being set adrift was when I started my own program uh, and my own th- and my own studio, mm-hmm. uh, and and it was kind of again a, a, a an intention to. To let go of my um, allegiance to any particular form of theater mm-hmm. or any particular group, uh, so and and get out and see. Okay, what if I let go of of my my own compliance issues <laughs> to be a good team member or to follow mm-hmm. the rules and the ones? Then what's going to happen? And that opened up the door for uh, for me to be to gradually discover that clown was kind of an umbrella over everything. Because they it allowed me to move from place to place, and to, and be intermodal, if you wish. Mm-hmm. You know, you know, there's I can I can draw from the the opera program, the opera territory, because I've got very involved in in that world, uh, and uh, both in, in training as well as um, uh, choreography and movement direction and direction mm-hmm. and so forth. So the, on stage and off stage, all these elements were drawn started to be drawn together and make sense and fit. And I had different vocabularies that I could draw from, from my own experience, mm-hmm. uh, as seemed and would be uh, appropriate and, and valuable in any given situation. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that process, again, was a rec- that's a clown process for me, just being able to, oh, be in this world, be in that world, you know, it's, I, don't have to be, I don't have to be owned by any single world mm-hmm. of uh, form of, of, of art, but, uh, and that, in fact, art, my allegiance wasn't to art. <laughs> it wasn't. Mm. To, it was to human beings. Yeah. Uh, I experienced a lot of people who, in my t- experience in teaching, that had um, uh, a strong a strong focus on the result, uh, and that's fine. You have to have that. And at the same time, they were overriding the way that people were being treated in the training and in the production world. 
uh, the artists were often being treated very poorly. Mm, and overriding uh, the, the process. Overriding too. the process and overriding their, in, their voice. Mm. They weren't even being trained to have a voice of their own. It's changing more now these days. Uh, to that individual dancers' voices, individual ar- mm-hmm. actors are you know of their what what's their intention? Where so is kind their of voice? fitting in the mold instead of creating the mold? That's to fit right. Into. That's right. Mm-hmm. And and uh, the clown fits in that covers that territory as well to meet your own world. What is your own world? You mm-hmm. know, you're going to associate with experience, but do you have to necessarily fit into someone else's model uh, of it? Uh, and that's been that just satisfied the rebel in me anyway, so it was fine. But uh, in the process of that, all that this collection of uh, uh, experience and even even the originating desire to be a doctor, and all the the, the, mm. the exploring of of the psychology of acting and the psychology of creation and the, uh, all the circumstances, you know, my own studies and, and in, uh, explorations of into that those aspects of things and through the new age world with you know different spiritualities and very various extended experiences uh you know that still are occurring for people in terms of ex- of opening up their existential questions and uh the the clown world overarched all of that because it's intermodal because it's individual is uh uniquely yours even though everybody's you're human it's mm-hmm. uniquely a, an experience of each person and in that, an individual uh, took my 12-week program uh, and in an intensive in clown and uh, was uh, an expressive arts therapist mm-hmm. and, I'd, and was very excited by the way that it worked and what the way I articulated the work. And the process. And the and process, mm-hmm. because it was intermodal. You know, there's painting, mm-hmm. there's sculpting, there's, there's dress-up, there's character, there's mm-hmm. relationship of communication. It's, it's a it's hugely rich thing that, that uh, the style that Richard created with the making of masks and, uh, uh, and the playing of the form uh, within them and then the, the clown playing amongst them all. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's something that really um, was a process that he wanted very much to have in, his, in a program because he and his wife wanted to create a program here to certify uh, expressive arts therapists. And they, this expressive arts therapy is uh, a program that, uh, or a, and a convention of, of approach that allows a, a relationship of the imagination to, uh, and the changing forms that the imagination can take and appreciates yeah. that. So it isn't, a, it isn't looking through it through a single lens except the lens of, ima- of opening up imagination mm-hmm. and expression of imagination. So the forms, the, uh, the, the therapist can follow and mm-hmm. work th- with the forms that, and change the forms that the imagination takes as it, uh, as it occurs with the individual who's, uh, who's being the client, if you wish, in... Mm-hmm. in uh, Kind of those terms, um, and and uh, and because I'd had these uh, um, experiences of develop of developing uh, methodologies for programs, and uh, I had done it three times by that time. The third time was with uh, Full Circle First Nations performance here in Vancouver, which I uh, helped and, and developed a, a two-year program for that training, and ran it out of my studio with uh, uh, with Margot Kane. Uh, in here in Vancouver, um, so I'd had a lot of experience with developing programs, uh, mm-hmm. and I lent that as a part of a founding member of that of the uh, program for the Expressive Arts Therapy Training Program at through Continuing Ed here at Langara, uh, and that's been running now ten years, and it's very very successful. The people working with it is very successful, and uh, I teach one uh, one component in that. Which is uh, a version of the uh, the mask uh, mm-hmm. clown training um, to provide them with an experience of intermodal work and to mm-hmm. open and connect with themselves uh, and recognize yeah. the, the values of that self realization and an invitation uh, to their own imagination. Exactly, yeah. exactly, and and uh, and it, I orient that the uh, the principles of the work to to the therapeutic process for that program, mm-hmm. 
but those principles are 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 part of every yeah everything that's uh, in that work. Mm-hmm. And I said Richard Richard had a had a a, a realization or a, a vision to help free people. Mm-hmm. The, the, uh, uh, had, that felt people were, were were trapped and wanting to get out hmm. of the f- of the uh, the forms that they um, they were holding or the held pressure in, of the having, pressures of yeah. the models and yeah. the behaviors and the things they're supposed to do and and all that. So that voice was a natural mm-hmm. part of me wanting to help people come and find that uh, find their own voice mm-hmm. beyond and and utilizing the skill and result training that they already had. Uh, in the opera, it was there, you know, as in dance, uh, uh, and even in acting, that the, there are some very strong forms that are are uh, are, are essential in the work. Uh, and in that, also, how do you bring the fire of your mm-hmm. your own intention and your own voice to it as an in, as an individual artist, uh, and still fit within these tight hmm. tight forms that are being asked for? And that's a, that's a, that's a very much an intrigue of mine. As much as also the the uh, the extension beyond that to let those things then ex- become become mm-hmm. uh, out of what you don't know yet, uh, meeting the unknown in that process uh, of becoming mm-hmm. uh, as a as an artist and and for me the 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 personal development it goes hand in hand with the artistic development uh, and the, so that. Your relationship with how you're doing what you're doing, and the investigation and openness to, with which to meet the the unknown mm-hmm. in yourself to actually meet newness and discovery, mm-hmm. rather than filling a model, but not disrespecting the, the form, yet recognizing how the form can reveal things in you, if you are open to receive what comes out of you or mm-hmm. each of us in the process of that and i do feel that that is a a, a key factor in in the in the artistic expression um with on many many levels uh it's all valuable um for where where the format of expression which i feel is our body mm-hmm. uh our breath our imagination and our emotions um comes through the it comes out and how how to value that um and technically guide it uh understand the structures of your own intentions as you begin to have a sense of intention uh of what is the source of inspiration for doing what you do Hmm. uh we ride it kind of naively uh naturally and and committing to that is very important and then gradually being able to to see more of the quote logic to it, hmm. the emotional logic, the rational logic, the physiological logic, that uh, as it aligns itself in an individual, you you see a fire of of motivation just take leaps and bounds, and the articulation that's brought into whatever form they're they're bringing becomes much more refined as as they sense the anchor or root of intention hmm. behind it for themselves. And we, we'll try. You have to try on different ones. You know, initially it might just be to please mom and dad, you know, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or, or something. You know, or a teacher, or and then gradually, you know, more and more, it's like a radar trying to hone in on on a focus of uh, of uniquely individual, hmm. whether or not it seems to be somebody else's or not. You know, and that's one one aspect I think of of, our, of artistry that um, that created individuals who had the power to stick. And stay true to their course. Mm-hmm. Uh, Martha Graham, Jose Limon, mm-hmm. Louis Horace. I mean, you can name in dance and, and in yeah. theater. Uh, you know, uh, very, uh, very, very. You know, Joe, Joe Chaikin, uh, Rutowski, um <laughs> Charles Ludlam, Theater of the Ridiculous. Uh, the, the people who did amazing, individual, unique things because they had the the fortunately or or unfortunately uh had the the wherewithal to to have a vision and Mm -hmm. see it through it's all quite different work but what brings them all together as artists is the fact that it's a very humanistic approach yes to to um artistic growth and and personal growth yeah yeah and that and that that for me was a realization in the mid-80s that my allegiance was to human beings as as I feel art sprang from human beings rather than 
human beings opposed to being applied to some art, hmm. uh, which you know different people have different opinions about. But um, but I feel that uh, the more an individual is grounded in their own uh, focus of intention, uh, the motivation, uh, the fire of motivation is much more evident in their work. Um, and they own it when they own it. Mm-hmm. Uh, e- even as they work together in, in something as meticulously challenging as uh, the Firebird or, or, or um, mm-hmm. Swan Lake, you know, mm-hmm. if, even if you're in the chorus, the, how, 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 how is what you're doing being, how do you frame it? How does it fit in your world? Mm-hmm. Uh, one way or another, and I think those who, who can, who have a drive like that, and there's varying varying levels of it. People are satisfied in different different dimensions of that, but if if it if it can ignite that spark, mm-hmm. I feel it's very powerful for an, for someone to. Uh, it's a scary thing mm-hmm. because you have to take risks for yourself, and yeah. you might you might, you know, you, if you're if you're out there, uh, the leading edge of your own uh, creation of things uh, uh I, I often describe it for for people uh, in my own from my own experiences feeling like you're you're the leading edge of your of your own um your own process mm-hmm. uh and so there's no references out there you, you're if you're the first speck of light in the darkness all you see ahead of you is darkness mm-hmm. and you have to turn around to see the light uh, and so you can back off the speed of that and have some light in front of you, and you need to do that. But but when you're if you're really out there creating, as they say, cutting edge things, mm-hmm. uh, whether they're cutting edge for the for the world, or but they might be it's going to be cutting edge for for the individual. Mm-hmm. And as you meet and can meet that edge mindfully, the, the cutting edge of what you know, and you're inspired by that and challenged by that and. Uh, capable of sustaining yourself in that process, uh, then it's it's a very uh, the, that process will 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 have results, uh, maybe surprising ones. Because mm-hmm. my journey, as I so far, is still I look back at it and can make sense of it. I had no idea in the process of doing the whole thing that it would be as curly cured, fractile as it as it has been, uh, or, or what sense it would be. It seems to make more sense now as I'm in my mid-60s than it did when I was 25. <laughs> <laughs> so it's been quite the uh, journey. Um, I mean, back in 1995, you founded the Fantastic Space Enterprises Studio, mm-hmm. um, which is a lot of what you're sharing right now. I believe yeah. that's what you put into um, into that the, yeah. the classes you offer and and. and uh, your your direction as a facilitator for, mm-hmm. for the arts. Um, what impact would you like to leave on the community here? Mm-hmm. Uh, not necessarily in Vancouver, but wherever it is your, whoever has the pleasure of encountering um, <laughs> you. What's the impact you'd like to leave? Or the imposition, depending on your point of view. <laughs> uh, or the influence. Mm-hmm. Um, the influence. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I th- I guess that's an interesting question to try and encapsulate but I, I I do feel that the core of it is uh, is supporting that unique point of view mm-hmm. um, a, that each individual has uh, and the capacity to share that point of view in some form uh, so that we can create so that a, a, a you can bring new awareness to others, with others. Uh, and that, that's, the fantastic, that's the fantastic space that, that, um, that Richard brought forward and coined in his work, um, that there's a we when you're performing. Hmm. And if you know you're, who you are at the moment <laughs> and you're honest about it and you're sharing and acknowledging the relationship with other in the communication, you're list, the, way, the quality of listening and the quality, that quality of engagement in relationship in communication is heightened. Uh, and lots can be different aspects of, can be carried of, of information in that, in that relationship. But that 
that we can meet the strength and appreciation that that personal and and professional go hand in hand and that they're not mutually exclusive mm-hmm. uh, and that they feed each other in a win-win situation in a healthy way that's not that, that isn't a corrosive uh, sense of oppression that sometimes in some forms in my experience in all the areas of training can can sometimes be very harsh and humiliating mm-hmm. uh, that uh, that there's a that that quality of gaining the strength to have your own direct perception uh, and to do that is very is a very um, power empowering thing to do uh, uh, as well as a very scary thing to do, and in doing that, reaching that territory of of even even creating a whole new vocabulary if necessary, mm-hmm. uh, demonstrated as as in gr- strong form, uh, uh, let's say Martha Graham her own whole technique, uh, or Artaud and and Beckett in the theater of the absurds, you know the 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 way that, that this is, I've got to find the form that expresses what I have to say. And I'll go and take any form and mix anything together and create new words or whatever I need to do to do it. Uh, to have that strength and to have this, in that strength, have the courage uh, and uh, ability to stay the, stay the course for that mm. and survive. <laughs> because it it's a drive that can be maddening it can and and can feel very very alone hmm. uh, uh so that an appreciation of solitude if you wish <laughs> <laughs> and not not only aloneness but it's it's that that kind of of recognizing that the human body the human spirit is born with all the faculties to do that and every one of us goes and does it somehow. Uh, evidence you can speak to anybody whether uh, uh, and look in the world and see how much we appreciate and can admire people who go through you know, tremendously difficult experiences and come through them. Uh, there, is a, there is a natural ability within all of us mm-hmm. to meet our own unknowns and thrive through them. Uh, and for artists who who have the privilege, I guess, uh, or the or the insanity to to m- to make forms of it, mm-hmm. to make artifacts, to express them through that, an addition. This is an addition of reality. This is an addition of my experience of of humanity, or my my comment about this and this and this, or whatever form it may take. Uh, to have this, to have that strength to do that, and to support the foundational pro- foundational processes that can be owned by those individuals, so that they can continue to be strategizing how mm. to be the cutting edge of their own <laughs> yeah. ongoing, wherever it may go. So the principles, I think that princ- the principle centered approach of uh, sh- of training in the, uh, that that allows that. And challenges people to recognize that in inborn strength that we have, mm. and to renew it into into uh, our with our present experience, and to, to renew it into action, so that, uh, as Richard would say, the innocence and the experience are coincidental, mm. and you need to you need to as the clown hold both polarities in in a dynamic balance <laughs> uh, of argument <laughs> together to. to uh, to stay on top and enjoy uh, and have the courage to meet the, those unknowns as they come. Mm-hmm. Uh, because there are times you're not going to be supported in what you think is necessary. <laughs> and, uh, and that calls a lot of different things to the fore in our, mm-hmm. in our fears, in our, in our rebellions, in our, all the different ways that it can take shape, all of which are... Uh, Material and source for the very thing that we're doing uh, mm. simultaneously. I don't know that. No, that's uh, great. Does it make any sense? <laughs> of course. Yeah. Thank it's, you it's, it's, so it's, much it's, for sharing, and it's uh, been a great pleasure. Uh, 
Um, we've been uh, talking to David McMurray Smith, um, and he guided us through his artistic journey as uh, a theater, ballet, opera, mime, clown, creator, performer, director, choreographer, <laughs> and all those fun things, and most of all, educator. So thank you for, um, thanks for all of that. You're very welcome. <laughs> thanks for listening. The Dirty Feet Podcast is produced and hosted by Produit et animé par Alison Burns J.D. Papillon et Stéphanie Morin-Robert We have Mainline Theater, Montreal Improv Theater and Paul of Lalo to thank. Merci pour le soutien. Vous pouvez visiter notre site web, écouter les derniers épisodes, lire notre blog, nous aimer sur Facebook et nous suivre sur Twitter. You can visit our website, listen to past episodes, read our blog, like us on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. Show us some love and help us spread the word. Montrez-nous un peu d'amour et aidez-nous à passer le mot.